This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. High school seniors are waiting to see what college they'll get into, and Harvard Law professor Lonnie Guineer says true merit admissions should be based on how well a student will contribute to society. Sociologist Caroline Lee explains the movement toward public engagement, a form of activism that brings diverse stakeholders together. And Bill Press talks with union leader Congressman John Larson about the future of Social Security. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Lonnie Guineer is a Harvard Law professor with some thoughts on how to introduce true merit into the college admissions process, which she says now privileges only the wealthy. And we say hello to Lonnie Guineer, who's a Bennett Bosky professor of law at Harvard Law School. She became the first woman of color appointed to a tenured professorship at the Harvard Law School. She is a leading expert on race in America and the author of a new book, The Tyranny of Meritocracy, Democratizing Higher Education in America. Lonnie Guineer, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you for inviting me. It's nice to have you with us. Uh, the word meritocracy... I think a lot of people would think of it as a good thing, a good way to promote people. But was it not originally a derogatory term? And and, and what exactly does it mean? Well, I don't want to – I I don't want to appear as if I'm the expert on the origin of the word meritocracy. It was a a term that that basically suggested – Talented people are chosen and moved ahead of other people on the basis of their achievements. That's one definition of meritocracy. And then there's the Greek idea that um, it's a political philosophy. But the way that I'm using the term is is really um, this notion of rule by merit. And then the question is, what do we mean by merit? Now, your book is about secondary and and higher education in what you call a testocracy. Is the traditional value of teaching a thing of the past? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question when you say the traditional value of teaching is is different than a testocracy. What I mean by testocracy or what the term, as I'm familiar with, has um has has been understood is that the way in which you determine that people are meritorious is that you give them a test and then their score on the test equals their merit and the question that I'm trying to raise is why do we associate a particular test with our understanding of merit when that particular test, if you examine it carefully fails to predict future performance in a reliable way. So you have, for example, in law school, people take the LSAT, and the assumption is that the higher your LSAT scores, the better you will do in law school. I actually had access to four years of um, LSAT scores at the University of Pennsylvania when I was a teacher there, and I worked with a sociologist and a numbers punch, a, 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 a numbers cruncher, and what we discovered is that the LSAT, the law school, um, quote unquote, achievement test or aptitude test, that it was predicting about 14% of the variance in first year grades and 15% of the variance in second year grades, meaning 85% and 86% of the time it wasn't predicting anything, but yet the value of doing well on the LSAT is, in our contemporary um, conversation, presumed to be a um, a way of measuring merit. Mm, mm-hmm. But, but it's, it's really a way of measuring your ability to take a particular test as opposed to the predictive um, value of that test. 
isn't studying for or teaching to a test an incentive for most students to master the subject matter? I mean, that's sort of that I, I want to do well on that test, so I want to master the – so, I mean, doesn't that make sense to do it that way? Well, no, but, but there are two separate lines of testing. One is presumably testing aptitude. That's the LSAT. Then there's another that's um, testing your accomplishment, meaning your ability to um, – understand and to apply appropriately information that you've received in um, one context and then you may apply it to another context. So th there are two separate forms of um, quote-unquote achievement and what I'm, 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 I'm not um, trying to interrogate the LSAT or the um, the particular test that students are um, asked to take a, a, in, in order to get a, um, a degree in law, what I'm suggesting or what I'm hoping to get people to think about is ultimately why are we so preoccupied with the way in which people perform before they get to law school or before they get to college, that is the, the hyper um, attention to your SAT scores or your LSAT scores when in fact the purpose of higher education is to train citizens in a democracy and so part of the goal that is missed by all of this testocracy is the goal of um, developing citizens who are going to be making um, uh, be, be put in a position where they are contributing to the larger society in terms of leadership, in terms of um, contribution of their time, in, t in terms of their ability to invent or to, to re-examine some of the assumptions that have been, that have dominated our thinking, but that may have been more appropriate in the 20th century than the 21st century. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Lonnie Guineer, uh, Bennett Bosky, professor of law at Harvard Law School, author of a new book, The Tyranny of the Merit Meritocracy, uh, Democ Democratizing Higher Education in America. Do you find it a, a paradox that as you try to democratize education, the best students wind up in private schools and public schools seem to wind up with the rest? Well, that's um, an area that I can't say I'm an uh, expert in, in in terms of um, education. Excuse me, prior to uh, college, but I I think what you're saying is that there's a wealth divide, and if you can afford to put your children in private school, many people choose to do that because they believe their child will get more individual attention from the teachers, and that there will be more preparation of that child to be able to compete to get into institutions of higher education, whereas in a more democratic society, our goal would be to try to the maximum to educate everyone because uh, people have many different ways of contributing to our society, but we're not taking advantage of the, of those ways in the way in which we're educating a um, a small percentage of the population based on their wealth, not based on their merit. Mm -hmm. Would you argue that individual achievement isn't as important as collective education? No, I'm not. That's not my. I think that's a misunderstanding of my position. I'm not saying that um, individual. It, it, that the learning of individuals in some ways is irrelevant and that the learning of people in groups is um, preferable. What I, that's not my position. My position is that when you get people to work together and to learn how to work together, that the, their ability as individuals to make a contribution to the um, the or a contribution with the people with whom they're working, that that's not only more democratic, but more likely to uh, um, promote or to at least draw attention to new ways of thinking, to um, deeper understandings of current problems, that a collaborative approach 
is in which you're bringing together people with different kinds of expertise is often a better way of solving a problem than just creating a competitive environment in which people have to demonstrate that they're smarter than the person sitting next to them. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest a fundamental change in what society values? I don't think it's, I think it's a fundamental value that is at the heart of our society, but it's a value that has been ignored rather than a value that's been developed. Ah, okay. Now, the rise of testocracy, is, is this the fault of, of the colleges, and, and how should we change things? Well, I, I, I'm not here to blame anybody. I'm, I'm trying to suggest that if we want to be a, um, a, a first-rate democratic in, um, place, uh, country, that... We want to take advantage of the skill set of all of our um, population, not just those who are wealthy. And the current system tends to privilege the people who are already wealthy by um, preparing them to to go up a ladder that is that a ladder that is um, closed to many other American citizens who also have something to contribute to the larger society, and. My basic um, thesis is that getting people to collaborate, getting people to work together, getting people to look at a problem from multiple perspectives is likely to produce more innovative and more um, relevant contributions to the larger society than one single person who happens to do really well on the LSAT. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like this is something that's that's almost ingrained from early education, the, the, this, this type of system. Is, do, you, do you think I'm off base with that? When you say it's it, it, early... In early education, in other words, our, our whole... Well, just all the way through, actually. I mean, all the way up into college. And, and, and it, it seems like this is our whole... The, the whole basis of our education system and the way that it works. But are you saying, for example, that in nursery school, the goal is to have the children compete with each other? I just meant at every at every level throughout. Yes, yeah, yeah. I don't think I, I think that's overstating the problem. Although I haven't been to a nursery school in a while, and maybe maybe you're right and I'm wrong, but I I think it's it's much more of a um, understanding of of the 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 role that quote unquote merit plays in a democracy. And here I'm um, quoting from Amartya Sen, who says that merit is an incentive system that rewards actions a society values. And the, the, the question you're raising is certainly a fair question, which is, well, does the society mainly value competition and individual achievement and, in, and individual wealth, or is the society a democracy in which we're trying to educate all of our citizens to make contributions from which we can all benefit. And if I had to choose, I would choose the the latter, meaning that this is a democracy in which we have many different um, kinds of expertise or of um, insight, but we're not taking advantage of the the possibility of 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 developing and enjoying the benefits of a fair democracy versus a competitive um, meritocracy in which everyone is climbing up the um, up up the tree to be to in order to dominate everyone else. It, and the latter seems to me much less democratic than the former. Mm-hmm. And probably more beneficial, as you point out, as well. Right. Mm-hmm. In, terms of, it, it, in terms of solving complex problems, in terms of developing a, a creed or a culture or a um, set of commitments that enable members of the society, despite the fact that they're not rich, to also be able 
not only to get be educated, but to be encouraged to then contribute the results of their education to the larger society as well. Okay. Lonnie Guineer, Bennett Bosky, professor of law at Harvard Law School, author of a new book, The Tyranny of the Meritocracy, Democratizing Higher Education in America. Professor Guineer, we appreciate your time with us today on americasdemocrats.org and look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Public engagement is a relatively new form of activism, and sociologist Caroline Lee says it can help corporations as well as community groups solve problems. We'll talk to her about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Ed, please call home. Edward Snowden, that is. Come quickly. Your country needs you. Once again, the American people are being victimized by a hush-hush blanket of official secrecy. This time, it's not about wholesale spying on us by our government, but a wholesale assault on our jobs, environment, health, and even our people's sovereignty by a cabal of global corporations and the Obama administration. Their weapon is a scheme hidden inside a scam called TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The scam is their claim that TPP is nothing but another free trade deal, albeit a whopper that ties our economy to Brunei, Vietnam, and nine other nations around the Pacific Rim. But of the 29 chapters in this deal, only five are about tariffs and other trade matters. The real deal is in the 24 other chapters that create a supranational scheme of secretive tribunals that corporations from any TPP nation can use to challenge and overturn our local, state, and national laws. All a corporate power has to do to win in these closed tribunal proceedings is to show that any particular law or regulation might reduce its future profits. This enthrones a global corporate oligarchy over us. Yet it's been negotiated by the 12 countries in strict secrecy. Even members of Congress have been shut out. But some 500 corporate executives have been allowed inside to shape the partnership. Now that Obama and his corporate team are ready to ram it through Congress, he arranged a briefing to woo House Democrats. But he classified it as a secret session, meaning the lawmakers can't tell the people anything they learn. This is Jim Hightower saying, Holy Thomas Paine! Obama is hiding his oligarchic scheme from us because he knows we would overwhelmingly oppose it. It's government by sucker punch, and it's cowardly. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Professor Caroline Lee tells us about the concept of public engagement, which tries to avoid professional activism in solving both corporate and community problems. And we say hello to Caroline Lee, Associate Professor of Sociology at Lafayette College and author of the new book, Do-It-Yourself, Doc, Demo- Do-It-Yourself Democracy, The Rise of the Public Engagement Industry. Caroline, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks a lot, Jim. It's great to have you here. Um, what is it about democracy that requires more of what you call dialogue and deliberation? Okay, so when you say dialogue and deliberation, I, I can just uh, you know see people uh, sort of closing their ears because that's such a that's such an academic term, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, academics have uh, sort of fallen in love with uh, this uh, this uh, term. 
terminology of dialogue and deliberation, or you'll hear things like um, deliberative democracy. Uh, and they've really seen this as an exciting opportunity to have more reasoned discussion and more education in this democracy that's currently dominated by really polarized, uh, you know, partisan um, uh, politics and, uh, of course, uh, big media. And so when, when I'm talking about dialogue and deliberation, I'm talking about these kinds of deeper public engagement processes that have come up in the last 30 years or so uh, that typically focus on uh, getting a cross-section of the public together and having them debate um, you know, a decision-making that affects them face-to-face. Uh, and uh, it's pretty obvious to see why um, why academics have, and you know, even members of the general public have seen those uh, sorts of processes as much more appealing than your standard uh, two minutes at a microphone uh, public meeting. And my work is actually looking at why this dialogue and deliberation has become more popular right now. And uh, you know, certainly these participatory forums have given Americans, you know, more opportunities to engage on issues that matter to them. But I'm arguing that they've done so in this atmosphere of austerity and retrenchment, and that's really why they've become popular. So public engagement today is used for tight times and tough choices, and you'll see those terms a lot uh, in these dialogues. So they tend to be used for urban redevelopment uh, in the face of capital flight, you know, when cities are really struggling. They tend to be used for child development so that poor youth aren't hindrances to economic growth. And uh, a lot of times they're used in corporations for workplace reorganizations after layoffs or when uh, corporations need to uh, cut health benefits. So yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Focus yeah, so public engagement focuses on these actions people can take right away to help fix problems in their communities, and that's the do-it-yourself part of DIY democracy, right? It feels empowering to be part of the solution. And I'm arguing that some problems are just too big to fix as individuals, right? Like volunteer trash cleanups are a great idea, and they can save cities a lot of money, but, um, but we've got, uh, you know, sort of bigger issues regarding budget priorities and, and how the public weighs in on those that, um, you know, that, that uh, could be addressed. Sure. And uh, just to give you a sense of how this works, right, how is it that uh, people talking together can end up saving cities or corporations money? They put participants in the role of decision makers, right? So you've got a tight budget. Um, you know, look at what uh, hard choices these administrators are facing on a tight budget. And, um, and that tends to encourage empathy for administrators, right? It raises what uh, participation experts call tax morale. So people are sort of more willing to raise taxes on themselves and more willing to give uh, businesses tax cuts. So I argue that engagement, it soothes the pain of all of these austerity uh, policies. So um, it aligns cuts with people's preferences. So, you know, if you're having a process um, where you're saying, uh, which cuts would you rather see in your health care? Nobody wants cuts, but if you're cutting things that uh, that people care less about, then then you know certainly that's better than the alternative, sure, right? Sure. But I'm arguing that if empowerment is just about empowering people to make hard choices without giving them a say in the issues that have precipitated those hard choices, that's a pretty skimpy version of deep democracy. What What about activism? Is it a business? And and who are the social entrepreneurs you write about? Okay, so yeah, you know this this idea about the intersection of social movements, businesses, and democracy in American politics is really what sort of motivates my, my interest in, in this project. We sort of like to draw these fine lines between social movements and, and uh, businesses and, and what pure politics should be. And if we're thinking about activists, um, you know, activism has gotten very professionalized in the U.S. So you have traditional interest groups and unions and professional activists, and they typically don't have much to gain in these public engagement settings, and, and you'll sometimes see them protesting high-profile events. Um, the the problem with interest groups and activism for deliberation or deliberative democracy is that people with strong affiliations are going to enter discussion with fixed positions, and they're going to be not very willing to change those positions, right? Public engagement processes want people to listen to others and to think about, uh, you know, positions that probably aren't very, um, very firmly held, and then maybe to change them based on, on new information. So, uh, you know, you see these sort of professionalized groups 
uh, of activists incorporated in sort of awkward ways into these uh, into these discussions. And a lot of activist groups have, have figured out what's going on and just decided not to engage, in part because they're successful at those traditional forms of participation and, and you know, things like litigation that uh, public engagement is very much designed to sort of avoid. But don't right? they sometimes impose new bureaucracies and just create more interest groups and middlemen? Yeah, you know, that's what you think, but um, a lot of those cost savings that I was talking about come about through getting participants to commit to individual actions that are going to save organizations money and take the place of staff and programs that were costly. So I, I did sort of get into this thinking, like, oh, it's so interesting that, that these participatory democracy techniques are being used, and, uh, you know, in the 1960s, those were sort of seen as uh, democratic and do-it-yourself, and now that's seen as a, a sort of professional affair. And, and really, Really, um, you know, this is skilled work, <laughs> getting a lot of diverse people to come together and not scream at each other. Um, but but uh, that, that these uh, processes uh, tend to go along with what academics call um, neoliberal policies. So that means sort of devolving decision-making to the local level, getting rid of, of uh, sort of middle managers and uh, government bureaucrats or um, administrators, you know, cutting red tape and having people at the ground level uh, decide. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 1960s, there was a great call for a participatory democracy. Why don't we have that yet? And is it even desirable, given the multitude of people with a multitude of opinions on a multitude of issues? So, you know, a lot of people would argue that the multitude of people with a multitude of opinions on a multitude of issues, that's exactly the reason why we need participatory democracy. And my book is looking at how we value different kinds of democracy, so you know, representative democracy, participatory democracy, uh, this newer kind called deliberative democracy. Why have we valued these at different periods? And in the current moment, we're in this period where participatory democracy seems less appealing than this sort of very small scale, more deliberative democracy. What I think is different here and, and new is the way that this new public engagement blends this kind of you know, Rockwellian nostalgia for pure politics, right? Just a politics that's not corrupted by interest groups, it's not corrupted by um, by big money. With it blends that with this very contemporary values like social justice and accountability, and then we see lots of other cultural threads that the book gets into, like positive psychology, uh, you know, new age spirituality, sports fandom. This all get blended into this uh, this new public engagement. So, you know, political scientists have really been looking at deliberative democracy as this great, um, you know, sort of ideal form of politics, and, and I'm looking at it as this sort of cultural product that. Um, you know, has seemed very appealing at this uh, particular point in time. Are Americans too busy or, or too ill-informed, perhaps, to want to even participate in public engagement meetings? Yeah, that, that's an assumption that, that lots of people have. And these these uh, public engagement processes are typically a lot more time-intensive and a lot more interactive than um, this standard sort of uh, measures of political engagement, like voting or signing a petition or calling your representative's office. So when public engagement works best, uh, it might catalyze those kinds of activities. So people talk to their neighbors, and then they get sort of interested in, in the topic. Um, it might uh, get them to talk to those neighbors. Hey, we should do some, um, you know, let's go, let's go exercise together. Uh, let's go do some litter pickups. Um, I think that's expecting a lot, right? That these that these uh, processes that people are going to uh, engage in them, they're going to talk all day with their with uh, you know other stakeholders, and then they're going to go home and talk to their family and their neighbors. Um, and often participants even exceed these expectations, right? There's been a lot of hand wringing among sociologists that civic engagement is declining and that digital participation, like like everyone's just clicking like buttons and they're not willing to get out there and actually, um, you know, talk face to face. Mm -hmm. And what these public engagement processes show is that people really are willing to spend a day engaging in dialogue. And, and after they participate, uh, you know, they generally um, say that they're glad they participated. They rate the experience really highly. Right? Uh, you know, public engagement exists to subsidize the participation of everyday people, those people who aren't uh, organized, who decision makers wouldn't hear from otherwise. And in part, that's because of structural inequality. So a lot of people do want a voice in decisions that affect them, and it's going to cost money to get them to participate. I, I call this, uh, this is an academic term, but I call this a subsidy, right? That organizations and sponsors are going to provide 
publicity, they'll provide child care, transportation services, they'll make processes accessible to people with disabilities. They'll provide all those subsidies that are going to make it easier for busy, um, you know, working people to participate. Isn't one of the problems that the experts in setting up democratic dialogues are, are better at organizing themselves than in getting results? In other words, are there too many grass tops, not enough grass roots? If we think about, uh, you know, the, your average uh, member of the public, they're going to be interested in participating in decisions that affect their lives. If you think a little bit further and, you know, are people interested in what the rules of participation are going to be? they're not going to be as interested, right? That's the place where public engagement professionals are probably going to be a lot more invested. And that's why we see them, uh, you know, doing this kind of grass tops activism. Um, and really, uh, there's not a lot of other uh, public participation there. So just as an example, you know, the Obama administration is currently working on developing a public participation playbook. So, uh, you know, just a sort of online guide of best practices. And they've been running a, you know, what they've called, quote unquote, a public uh, process uh, for people to give input um, into a Google Doc. And, uh, you know, I've been observing that. And basically everyone who's participating is either a federal official or one of these members of the public engagement industry. You're just not going to get the general public interested in what are the rules for how we should do uh, public engagement. And, and I think that's, that's pretty uh, – people can understand why that would be. Okay. Caroline Lee, Associate Professor of Sociology at Lafayette College, author of the new book, Do-It-Yourself Democracy, The Rise of the Public Engagement Industry. Caroline, thank you so much for your time with us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again soon. Great. Thanks a lot, Jim. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Congressman John Larson. The Social Security. Uh, a lot of people say it's in trouble, and some others say we ought to privatize it. There are those who say it's not in so much trouble, but we can make it a lot stronger and a lot better and make sure it's going to be around for um, future generations. Congressman John Larson is one of those trying to strengthen and save Social Security. He joins us in studio from the first district of the state of Connecticut with new legislation to do just that. Hey, Congressman, good to see you. Hey, great to be with you, Bill. Thank you. St. Patrick's Day was the day you were put to introduce this legislation. Well, it's the luck of the Irish, as you know, <laughs> Bill. But, uh, <clears throat> Let's hope. We Let's want hope, to be bestowed right? on... Uh, we hope it's the common sense of the Irish that gets to our. But you are out colleagues. there, not not alone uh, with this with this legislation. A good number of your fellow uh, Democrats in Congress. Well, more than fifty six of them are original co sponsors. We expect that we'll uh, pick up. Uh, we'll be well over a hundred that will be sponsors of this bill, and I think primarily because of its pragmatic, common sense approach. I also believe that we do have a shot at uh, Republicans. I know that that's a reach, especially in this uh, environment, in this Congress. But what we're proposing is when you're looking at Social Security, and as you said at the top, you know, with the disability portion uh, being at risk in 2016, and then, of course, uh, more than a uh, 25 percent cut in 2033, Now is the time to act. Well, the Republicans have doubled down, and in their budget, in their budget fight even last night, they doubled down on a rule that they put in at the start of the session. That rule said that you cannot deal with Social Security and its parts. You have to take it up as a whole. The idea being that if you're going to repair it, you have to repair it as a whole. And they didn't see, and it has to be offset. So the only other thing would be to make cuts in those areas. That simply is unacceptable. At a time when more Americans are retiring, at a time when America finds itself in a pension crisis, less than 14% of the American people retire 
with a defined contribution as a benefit. Is that right? That's right. The median income, ready for this, the median income that a person has set aside for themselves in retirement for the country, $2,100. No. Whoa. If ever, if ever there was a time when we needed so, to make sure the best safety net program in the world not only stays solvent to the century, Mm. but also is enhanced and expanded to make sure that we're taking care of the American people, who, by the way, this is not a tax, and this is not an entitlement. This is earned compensation. This is yeah. the insurance that they've paid for, Bill. You know right. this, and, yeah. but you know it's called the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. It's not the Federal Insurance Tax Act. Mm-hmm. The contribution being made by but imagine where those, 20, those people who... With twenty one hundred dollars, or imagine where they would be without Social Security. Without imagine Social Security. the seniors who would be living in poverty today without Social Security. Well, that's one of the great things that this bill does. One of the things we do in enhancing it, and let me cut right to the yeah, chase with please. with that. We expand Social Security across the board to give a two percent increase to everyone from top to bottom across the board. We then also fix the cola. The call, and you may have heard, and I know uh, how much you railed against this whole notion of chain CPI, chain CPI which is ridiculous. It only ends up taking more money away from people who are going to need it in old age. What we've gone to is something that the AARP and a number of people endorse called CPIE, which actually takes into consideration the cost that the elderly, therefore CPIE, mm-hmm. incur, whether it's medical, whether it's food, whether it's rent whether it's heat or uh, gasoline to put in their cards, all of which uh, is uh, vitally important. Uh, We also make sure that nobody can receive Social Security. No one can retire into poverty. So we raise the rate for Social Security, the minimum rate, to 125 percent of poverty. That will take people at at the poverty Mm -hmm. level who are retiring now will get a more than a 50 percent increase in what they're receiving right now, which is not a lot. And, uh, you know, the average retirement, especially for women on Social Security, many of whom I talk to in my district, Mm -hmm. $12,800. that, 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 that's poverty. I and mean, you, yeah, that is poverty. Yeah. And so you, 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 you get to appreciate that. Well, the story even gets better. And here's why I think we have uh, an opportunity to get a lot of Republicans. First of all, they are, have this issue about taxes, and they want to make oh, sure yeah. that these oh, things. Yeah. Well, yes. our program will both make disability and the old age and retirement system and survivor's benefit solvent. It will make it solvent into the next century. How do we know that? Well, we know that by the gold standard of Social Security. The Social Security actuaries have actually issued a 22-page report going through every single aspect of this bill Hmm. and saying it's the only bill that makes Social Security meets the test of 75 years and beyond, ergo the title, uh, the uh, Social Security 2100 Act. Oh, is that? Uh, Yeah, I like that. And what we also do, Bill, is provide a tax break here. Now, I said earlier this is a def- this is a uh, You're earned, talking tax break. Company. You might get some Republican votes. Well, yeah. here, 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 and here's the interesting thing about that. So, as you know, more seniors <clears throat> are working still. Yeah. And if you're a se- here we <laughs> are here we are. <laughs> and if, if you're a senior and you're working uh, today and you're single and make more than twenty five thousand dollars, you are taxed on your the contribution that you made. The Social Security mm-hmm. contribution that you made is not mm-hmm. taxes, but you would be taxed on it if your combined Social Security and pensions are, if you're single, more than $25,000. If you're a married couple and make more than $32,000, uh, you're taxed as well. So <clears throat> to show you how startling this is, and you, it makes sense when you look at what's happening to the baby boomers and the number of whom are now coming through our system. In 1990, that tax uh, hit 26% of all retirees. In in 2014, it hit 50%. Next year, it'll be 54%. Wow. So what we do is raise the amount to 50,000 per individual 
and to 100,000 per couple, which sure. means 11 million Americans will no longer have to pay that tax and they'll be able to keep that money so that they're in their pockets so that they can address uh, yeah. the various concerns that we allude to. Now, how do you pay for all of we this? We pay for it in two ways. First of all, we scrap the cap. But we do it in a way, and I heard you talking earlier about the budget and the middle class and the concern that we have here. We do that by saying, as you know, uh, Bill, currently the uh, uh, <clears throat> you pay on the uh, $118,000 right. of Social Security. Then anyone who earns more than that stops paying. I know. No one pays any more into it after 118000 Rather unfair from a progressive standpoint yes. when you look at someone earning $30,000 who pays the same amount same. as someone earning $30 billion. So what we do is say, okay, we're going to scrap the cap, but then we're going to create a donut hole of our own for the middle class. And we're not going to tax again until over $400,000. Now, that's a tax on four-tenths of 1% of the American people, mm. most of whom, like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and others have said, do it. For yeah. God's sakes, Glad this makes sense. It. We right. want to see a program like this succeed. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that we do to get the longevity into the program, and I truly believe this, that everybody has to have skin in the game. And because this is the most important program that the federal government does, meaning, as you know, that it's a... Uh, a pension, <clears throat> excuse me, a pension benefit program. It's a uh, disability program. It's a survivor's benefits program. If you were to try to get that on the open market, the, it would be cost prohibitive. Absolutely. But because we come together as an entire nation to take care of one another and because of the low administrative cost of Social Security, we're able to provide this for the whole nation. So... I want to do something that hasn't been done for 30 years, and that's to increase the fund by 1%. Oh, 1% is a lot when you're talking about those, those numbers. Yeah, it is. But we phase it in over 25 years so that it amounts to a 50 cent a week increase to get hmm. yeah. disability coverage, to get survivor's benefits, and to have a retirement plan that is going to be solvent into the next century with enhanced benefits and an enhanced COLA. And that is what has the actuarial saying this is the soundest proposal that's out there. It does not increase the national debt. It is paid for incomplete and takes us into the 21st century. And by the way, <clears throat> even past the Republicans doubling down because we take care of both disability, mm -hmm. and Social Security, without which, you know, there'll be a cut of 25% in 2033 in the retirement portion and as early as 2016 with respect to disability. So, I mean, this is, the t and this is, the t I think, a, a very important point which you made earlier. This is the time to do it, right? It, not it, not wait till the, till the last minute as the Congress seems to always want to do, at least the Republicans Oh, do. yeah. No, no, no. Right. Uh, no brinksmanship. Just do it now with a solid plan and put the plan in place, and then won't have to worry about it. And, and broad support, too, from the outside groups that have been working on this, too. Oh, I mean, I you bet. know Nancy Altman. I'm sure she's probably been on your show with Social Security Works and mm -hmm. Max Richmond, you know, with the National Max Committee, yep. you know, for the uh, preservation of Social Security. All have endorsed this fully. fully. And I, I honestly, and everyone says, well, you know, you're too much of an optimist. But I really do think that when the Republicans have an opportunity to look at this, and I want to get into their heads a little bit about this, because this is not a tax that we're calling on people to do. This is a contribution. This is then earned compensation for the contribution they put they, into they put the program. In, sure. yeah. And uh, too often, you know, there's been this very opaque but not so subtle means of trying to uh, look at Social Security and Medicare as entitlements, as though people haven't paid for these. Certainly people are entitled to those benefits, but they're not entitlements no. in the sense that food stamps and other uh, areas of the budget would be. And I think it demeans the American people and demeans the concept of us coming together under in the land of e pluribus unum uh, under the Constitution and we the people forming a government to create that perfect union that looks out 
for one another, especially in times like this. It's so great to see somebody stand up to step, step up for Social Security and say, Look. and by the way, as you point out, I mean, this is this is great benefits, but not that complicated. It's not, you know, straightforward, yeah. simple, very pragmatic, uh, insulates and protects the middle class, raises up the working poor so that they get a better benefit. Benefits across the board, even the people that we're going to tax more are going to get more money. That's in keeping with uh, a lot of what the AARP has talked about and others. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we feel very uh, good about the uh, uh, the plan, and uh, we're going to be all over it. Uh, well, and we'll be, we'll be uh, talking a lot about it, too, and hope, hopefully uh, have some more time with you to talk about it, Congressman. So it's Social Security 2100 Act. 2100 Act, all right. People can find out from your website. Is that the best place to yes, go to find out about it? Or and where's, and, where and, uh, and it's uh, HR 1391. HR 1391. And we'll have a link up uh, on our website where you can Absolutely. find out uh, yes. more about it. You've got a lot of work to do, Congressman. We're going to let you go and get back there to uh, round up some more members. Absolutely. Thanks so much for hey, coming Bill, in. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks, Congressman. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Lonnie Guineer, Caroline Lee, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate. Donate.